Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. State police are deployed across the state as protests continue over police treatment of African Americans. I want them to know that I, I'm peaceful. I want every, like, I want peace as well. This is what democracy is. In the midst of the pandemic, Hoosier voters went to the polls this week for the state's primary election. Coming up, what we know about who will be on the ticket for the general election in November. Indiana University is beginning to reopen and that means some students are returning to Bloomington. We are going to be asking people to take some personal responsibility. I mean, that's all part of what we're going through right now, that this we're all in this together message is really about we have to take care of each other. How the city and university are working together to bring students back safely. And our environmental reporter brings us a story about a project to help cities close the gaps in tree cover. Those stories and more right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Well, state health officials say the number of COVID-19 deaths appears to be slowing. Numbers the State Department of Health releases each day show it's been more than a week since more than 20 deaths have been recorded in a single day. We'll have more on that. But first, protests are against, against police brutality are continuing across the country. In many cities, including some here in Indiana, demonstrations have turned violent. Nationwide, there have been about 10,000 arrests since the unrest began following the killing of George Floyd May 25th in Minneapolis. Indiana's governor activated the National Guard. Hundreds of state police have been dispersed throughout the state and in many cities. Local officials have enacted curfews. Governor Holcomb says violence must be addressed so the state can have important conversations. Thousands of protesters marched through the streets of Indianapolis this week. Things have been mostly peaceful since the city enacted a curfew, but over the weekend, three people were killed, businesses and buildings were damaged, and officers deployed tear gas. Governor Eric Holcomb says the Indiana State Police and National Guard are ready to deploy to any community around the state that requires assistance. They need to know that we are pouring in all of the resources available to meet those flashpoints. Holcomb says he wants to de-escalate the situation so real conversations about solutions can happen. So where we can find common ground to move forward. Black leaders at the State House produce agendas every year that are largely ignored by Republican leaders. Just hours after the governor promised to work on his to-do list for addressing systemic racism in the state, protesters almost made it to his front door. We're just trying to keep everybody abreast of how to how to you know, uh, disperse and how to decompress any situations that come up as we're trying to do that. In Bloomington, protests have remained peaceful, with activists staging small-scale demonstrations around the courthouse. Black Lives Matter! I want them to know that I, I'm peaceful. I want every, like, I want peace as well. This is what democracy is. Meanwhile, Bloomington's mayor encourages anyone motivated to protest to follow social distancing guidelines, wear masks, and remain peaceful. The use of tear gas and other irritants as a crowd control technique is gaining attention this week after several incidents during protest against police brutality. Indianapolis Police Chief Randall Taylor apologized after his officers used tear gas on a peaceful demonstration Sunday. A day earlier in Fort Wayne, a young man lost his eye after being struck in the face with a tear gas canister. 
In addition to the unusual or the usual risk of using gas, experts fear it may be spreading the coronavirus. Peter Chin Hung is an infectious disease specialist at the University of California, San Francisco. Say they were sprayed with pepper spray or with, uh, with uh, tear gas, all of a sudden they're going to sh uh, cough. And we know that coughing is much more an efficient way of spreading the virus because the virus travels on these droplets. Chin Hung helped edit a letter signed by more than a thousand health professionals and community leaders calling on police to stop using tear gas or other irritants that could make the respiratory tract more susceptible to infection, increase inflammation, or induce coughing. The group is urging authorities to maintain distance from protesters and to avoid arresting people or detaining them in confined spaces like jails or police vans. The letter points out that the COVID-19 pandemic is disproportionately harming black communities. This week, the state reached a grim milestone. The number of Hoosiers who have died since mid-March surpassed 2,000. If you had asked me 10 weeks or 12 weeks ago that we'd be sitting here with this many Hoosiers who have lost their lives from this particular disease, I think I would have had trouble understanding that. It's been the hardest part of this job, uh, quite honestly. The number of deaths in Indiana is about the equivalent of the entire population of the town of Orleans in the southern part of the state. Meanwhile, Eli Lilly is working on what it calls a first-of-its-kind study for a potential COVID-19 antibody treatment for humans. In phase one of the study, hospitalized COVID-19 patients are being dosed at medical facilities to closely track safety and how they respond to the treatment. Initial results of the study are expected in about a month. While medications currently on the market have been repurposed to fight COVID-19, this new treatment is specifically focused on treating the virus, and a survivor's blood was used to develop it. Well, state health, uh, state fair officials say they had no choice to but call off the state fair. It was scheduled for August, but event organizers say preparing for the event requires collaboration with hundreds of businesses and thousands of part-time workers, and they couldn't delay a decision any longer. The fair usually attracts about 900,000 people during its nearly three-week run. On the number of COVID-19 related deaths in nursing homes, the state is reporting much lower than what was released this week in a federal report. A report released by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services on Monday listed 1,141 total COVID-19 deaths among nursing home residents as of May 24th. That number is 196 or 21 percent more than the 945 such deaths reported this week by the Indiana State Department of Health. State officials suspect the difference stems from Indiana nursing homes only being asked once in early April for a total number of previous COVID-19 deaths and infections, while they have since been required to report new cases within 24 hours. Meanwhile, state officials are working on guidance allowing nursing homes to permit outdoor visits by residents with family members and friends. While the congregate nature of a nursing home can amplify the spread of COVID-19, recent evidence in the scientific literature has shown that transmission risks are much lower outdoors. Family and friends who come to visit will be screened for COVID, which could include temperature checks. Well, emerging data shows that racial and ethnic, ethnic minority groups are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Since the pandemic started, IU professor Kosali Simon has been working to collect data on how job losses during the crisis have affected different types of families and workers. She says it's not surprising to see vulnerable populations disproportionately burdened by the pandemic, given rising unemployment rates, especially in industries that rely on face-to-face -face contact. When we think about vulnerable communities, there's quite an overlap between who's vulnerable in a health care or health sense, as well as who's vulnerable in an economic job market sense. Simon says data she helped collect in March indicate the largest numbers of job losses are among young workers, Hispanics, women, workers with four or more children, and less educated employees. And this week's unemployment numbers show 24,000 Hoosiers applied for unemployment benefits last week as the state followed the national trend of slowing job losses after coronavirus-related businesses closed, closure started in mid-March. About 240,000 Indiana residents received jobless aid for the week ending May 23rd. That is down from the peak of nearly 295,000 in early May, just before statewide business and travel restrictions began being eased. 
Well, the way people work is changing because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that includes state lawmakers. Legislators have been conducting summer study meetings via Zoom, but as Adam Pinsker tells us, the long-term picture of how the legislature will work is still unclear. Senate and House leadership are meeting this summer to determine what alternatives are available if lawmakers can't meet at the Capitol here when the legislative session begins in January. The business of state government must continue, even as the coronavirus pandemic brought much of the country to a standstill and is changing the way we interact every day. When the legislature reconvenes in 2021, it will be after a major election year and at the beginning of the next budget cycle. We were one billion, with a B, one billion dollars short of our forecast in April. And prior to that, we were humming along at, uh, uh, frankly, comfortably over our revenue forecasts. Bloomington Democratic State Representative Matt Pierce says he's concerned about how lawmakers and the governor will make do on a promise from last year that included teacher raises in the 2021 budget. This is a problem that was created by the General Assembly when it replaced property tax funding of the schools, for the most part, with state sales tax funding. Crafting a budget and cutting spending won't be the only challenges facing lawmakers. This summer, a continuity committee will meet to determine how the legislature and executive branch could operate should a pandemic, natural disaster, or terrorist attack hobble state government. We better try and find out how we can function and what Laws need to be changed and allowed to allow us to function under those kind of circumstances. Senate President Pro Tem Rod Bray says the immediate challenges of physical distancing during the pandemic will be difficult to deal with during the legislative session when multiple rooms are being used for committee meetings. It will be much more difficult, though, to, uh, to try and conduct our legislative session because we have you know, committee hearing after committee hearing multiple during the day. Lots of people come in to testify. Republican Bray and Democratic State Senator Jean Bro agree that an arrangement needs to be made to allow lawmakers to vote remotely or one at a time rather than all at once. Bro says old rules that bar lawmakers from not being able to vote if they aren't in the chamber should be changed. If they were able to um, turn into the uh, events of what was happening on the on the chamber in the chamber, they should be allowed to vote. House member Pierce says changing the rules to allow voting on Zoom isn't the only issue that must be decided should the legislature hold its entire 2021 session virtually. They're also going to have to study the Constitution because I think there may be some language in the Constitution that says the legislature has to sit in Indianapolis. So I don't know what it would mean if all the legislators are actually attending the legislature from home. Lawmakers are still being paid a salary which is handed out in full at the beginning of the year, but they're not being paid for travel expenses this summer as long as committee meetings are held via Zoom. Senator Bro says legislators on summer study committees such as herself must also look at how the 2020 election will be held if long lines at polling stations create a health hazard. No matter which party you're affiliated, it's a critical election. And uh, if people are fearful, of uh, going out and, and casting their ballots in, in the traditional way, then that may mean that the numbers of uh, participants is, is uh, sorely decreased. Senator Bro says she'd like to see her colleagues pass an aid package similar to what the federal government passed a few months ago that would benefit families and small businesses throughout Indiana. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. November's general election ballot is taking shape. The state's primary was delayed until this week because of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, there weren't any challenged races for statewide elected offices in this year's primary. The biggest races were for the congressional seats being given up by Democratic Representative Pete Visklowski and Rep uh, Republican Representative Susan Brooks. State Senator Victoria Spartz won the Republican nomination to replace Brooks. Former State Representative Christina Hale won the Democratic primary and will face Sparts in the November election. Democrat Frank Mervin won the first step toward replacing longtime Representative Pete Visklowski in the state's northwestern Indiana stronghold. Well, the race for the District 40 state Senate seat, which covers much of Monroe County and Indiana University, was wide open after Mark Stoops announced his retirement. Shelly Yoder clinched the Democratic nomination. And we have to do everything that we can to make sure our brown and black neighbors know that Hoosiers and the state of Indiana, we will fight like heck to make sure that everyone feels valued.
And in the 9th Congressional District, former Bloomington City Council member Andy Ruff won the Democratic primary. Ruff will face incumbent Republican Representative Trey Hollingsworth in the general election. And Indiana State Representative Jeff Ellington beat his primary opponent, Greg Knott. Ellington is running for second term, serving District 62. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Students are returning to Bloomington ahead of how the city and IU are working together to safely resume university operations. 50 Indiana cities are taking inventory of their trees ahead of how they plan to use the data. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Students will return to IU this fall. The university announced its reopening plans last week, which include a mix of in-person and online classes. Without a vaccine, the question is how to bring students back safely to protect the campus community and Bloomington residents. As Mitch Legan reports, the university is establishing rules that could include requiring students to sign a pledge to follow safe practices. The coronavirus pandemic led to an abrupt end to in-person classes in March when IU sent students home. With in-person classes resuming this fall, both the University and City of Bloomington are planning for thousands of out-of-town students to return. Generally, we are advising students to not come back until we begin instruction and they are here for classes. IU Bloomington had more than 33,000 students enrolled in in-person classes this spring. Nearly 30,000 of them were from outside of Monroe County. When you have many thousands of people returning from all over the country, that's going to be a, a source of risk. And uh, we need to be ready for that and take it very seriously. And it's kind of like when your weather looks good right now, but the radar forecast says there seems to be a big front coming in, you, you got to be ready for it. The mayor spent time speaking with leaders from other cities that are home to Big Ten universities, including Madison, Wisconsin, and Champaign-Urbana in Illinois. Most of it is, is sharing um, things like, well, how do your public safety uh, police departments work together on these issues? I know there's some email exchange with College Park, Maryland, for example, about uh, how, are, how are you thinking about the boundaries of campus and behaviors on one side or the other. And, it's complicated, and we're talking to IU about that. IU junior Jack Romer never left Bloomington. His family decided it might be safer for him to stay in place than move back home, since his sister's job put her in contact with many people. But he says a lot of his friends are planning on coming back early after being stuck at home all semester. I think that we're going to see you know, probably more and more people return to Bloomington, especially if they're from like you know Chicago, New York, uh, you know, Philadelphia. It's like those really... Like where a lot of people that go to IU are from and where it's probably more of like the epicenter. Bloomington's encouraging social distancing and recently launched a campaign to encourage people to wear masks. But there's no requirement. The university is still working on the details, but there's talk of a strict mask wearing policy and a required class on safe practices. IU still is going to have to be calibrating what is the prevalence of the disease like in August, in September, in November, and that will, will necessarily drive some of the behavior and decisions that they take. Another part of IU's plan for the upcoming session involves removing the fall break and shifting the final stretch of the semester after November 30th to online learning only. The same will be done with the spring semester, except classes leading up to February 7th will be strictly virtual. And a lot more details are still to come, but simple things such as not having more than 50 in a classroom space, and that allows us in a large space, we can space people out enough 
to, so that that will uh, provide safe social distancing. In addition to physically spreading out students, the university is adjusting the class schedule to create a longer passing period between classes so there won't be as many people walking around campus at the same time. IU is also making all of its residence hall rooms single occupancy. This is going to be something where we truly are going to be relying on each other and we're going to be asking students and faculty and staff to make a commitment to each other because that's really how we're going to be able to do this in this forum and move through this particular time. Still, both city and university officials stress there's only so much that can be done. When it comes down to it, slowing the spread of the coronavirus will be up to individuals to take the proper precautions and ensure everyone's safety this coming school year. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. And some IU student athletes will begin voluntary workouts this month. The football team is the first group scheduled to come back. Other sports will follow in July and August. Each student athlete will be required to go through a daily medical check before being cleared to participate in workouts. The university says it's working with the best doctors to establish protocols and make sure they are strictly followed. Well, trees do a lot more than just look nice. Urban trees do everything from improve moods to help a city withstand the effects of climate change. The Indiana University Environmental Resilience Institute is working to compile a statewide urban forest map. As Indiana Public Broadcasting's Rebecca Thiel reports, they want to help cities close the gaps in tree cover so everyone can benefit. If you want to get into Tyler Van Vlera's line of work, he has this advice. Probably pick up a good pair of shoes. <laughs> Van Vlera does tree inventories for Davy Resource Group. In February, he walked almost every block of downtown Columbus, making a note of each tree he saw, including its size, type, and condition. That data will eventually end up in an interactive map. It may seem tedious, but Van Vlera says having this information is really valuable for cities. Inventories are important because you can't really manage what you don't know, right? Columbus is one of more than 50 cities in Indiana that have or are working on tree inventories. Van Vlera says communities are starting to realize that they can't take their trees for granted. Trees can help make towns more resilient to climate change and boost their economies. Like many cities in Indiana, the emerald ash borer wiped out a lot of trees in Indianapolis. That prompted the city to do its first inventory, but Indianapolis urban forestry manager Bill Kinches says the city has seen more benefits than just knowing where to replant. Indianapolis's trees absorb more than 500 million gallons of water a year. With climate scientists predicting more rainfall for Indiana in the future, these trees may be more important than ever in protecting the city from flash floods. Trees, as we've all experienced, when when it rains, the trees will uh, collect rainwater and sort of intercept that um, amount of water and keep it, at least delay it from going into the stormwater system. And that really helps um, us avoid flooding issues. Indiana University professor Sarah Mincy is helping to collect these tree inventories from cities to put together a statewide urban forest map. If we want to just look at the, the um, maple trees, we can uh, filter it. We can filter this data set. She says shade trees can help cool cities down, combating the extreme heat we're seeing as the earth warms. Mincy says this is especially important in low-income and minority communities, which, because of things like redlining, are less likely to have tree cover. She says an urban tree map can help cities to see those equity gaps. How can we improve our urban forest and make sure that the ecosystem services that come from trees are equitably distributed to all people? Mincy says trees make cities more walkable, too. And so if, if it's a hot, sunny day um, and you don't have shade, then you might choose to jump in your car. And of course, that means there's uh, emissions from the car that contribute to um, uh, climate change. Trees can also help a city's economy. Crawfordsville is losing younger residents in droves. Mayor Todd Barton says industries in the area need those young workers, like LSC Communications and Nucor Steel. He says street trees were one of the things area high school students said they want in a city. Lucas says people who live and work in an area are more likely to invest in a community with trees. People spend a little bit more money when they can relax, when they can park uh, under a tree 
when they can sit under a tree and have a coffee with a friend. IU professor Sarah Mincy says perhaps seeing the statewide urban forest map will encourage other cities to do their own tree inventories. Her team hopes to make it public by the end of the summer. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Rebecca Thiel. And if your plans include going to the lake this weekend, you'll want to keep in mind that some of the beaches are closed. Indiana's Department of Natural Resources says that the Fairfax and Paintown State Recreation Areas at Lake Monroe will be, cl will be closed through the weekend due to rainfall over the past few weeks raising the lake. The Paintown Boat Wrap, though, is still accessible. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.